Hey guys, Drifter here. Today I've got a video for you that's a little bit more off the cuff than usual. I'm going to be talking about what makes a person bad, what makes them good, what makes them evil was the original title, but I thought bad would be a little bit better. I'm going to be telling personal stories from my childhood, mostly ones about my grandfather because for the better part of my life he was the boogeyman, he was the bad guy, he was the person that I honestly hated and couldn't get along with for a lot of different reasons. However, I wanted to add some perspective on that and discuss what actually does make a person good or bad. The gameplay that you're going to get to see is the CBJMS here on on ruins. I do get the predator kill streak and I stay as the predator playing stealthily for the better part of this game. And then we're going to swap over to a game where I'm playing 1v4, meaning I'm the only person in my party and there's four tryhards on the other team. They're working together very well. They beat me down really hard, like 5 and 12, 15 in the beginning. And then I come back on a really good tear with a chainsaw. But that's the gameplay. Let's move on to the commentary. And I will warn you that the commentary is going to be a little bit more rough than usual. There will be swear words today. We will be discussing uh, race relations in the South back in in the day, so there's going to be a lot of racial epithets used in context, mind you, not just to be insulting, so do be prepared for that. So, my grandfather was my boogeyman. He was my bad guy. Pretty much every story that I tell about him, even today, is, is largely negative, even though that might not necessarily be fair to the person. So that's why I decided to make this video, to kind of point out that there are two sides to every coin, that every person that is bad is also good in some ways. If you watch Game of Thrones, a lot of the Lannisters are like that, like Jaime and uh, the Dwarf and some of them. But a little bit of background on my grandfather, he was born into a Depression-era family early, I think it was like 1917, 1918, something like that. Grew up in the Depression, no food, no resources, no jobs. Uh, he did World War II service, both in the Coast Guard and manufacturing the boats down on the coast in New Orleans, just, you know, straight up building them, which was a very difficult job. Later in life, he got a job as a salesman at a uh, food processing company, mostly meats, mind you, and worked that in a manager later on, and then eventually the company got bought out so most of what he had invested in it turned into pot, but I thought that might be relevant uh, just for some background so you kind of understand. Also grew up in the South, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, very, very deep South stuff back in the day, so there's a lot of race stuff we're going to be talking about today. But uh, another thing is that this guy that I'm talking bad about was also the person that taught me how to read and how to write and how to do math. So when I was a kid, I actually lived with my grandparents. I didn't live with my dad until I was maybe eight, nine, ten years old. And then, you know, later again when I was uh, in my teenage years. But they more or less raised me constantly. My grandmother didn't teach me anything when the early. So my grandfather took it upon himself to teach me how to read. He'd sit me down and read me books and then teach me, not like a, you know, professional teacher, but just kind of go at it. Taught me a lot of math. He taught me that being smart is often more important than being strong, which is something that I carry with me to today. And you know, I noticed as I walk under the water here, the predator uncloaks, which I had no idea before, but it works like that in the movie, so it works like that in the game. And if it were not for him, I would probably be a total failure in education right now. Um, uh, just perfectly honestly, there would be no in-depth, there would be no smart drifter, it would be drifter, the anti-intellectual, the derp, that sort of thing. And yet at the same time, he was abusive both with me and my grandmother, and by abusive, it was to the point where, uh, you know, sometimes you get spankings, that happens, that's not child abuse, but you ever get a spanking to the point where it's not that you're being punished, but they're just furious at you, so they're going to hit you until you feel better? That kind of spanking. Grandmother steps in the way, uh, she gets a, well, no, it's more like a beating with the, uh, instead of a spanking, but that kind of stuff. A little bit of abusive on her, I'm saying a little bit, it wasn't as bad as what you're probably thinking, like every day. It would happen uh, every month, two months, something like that. So, you know, it was something relatively normal on the sphere of, we'll say, dysfunctional relationships. Yet, he also worked very hard to financially support us both. So through all that hate, hatred, all those beatings and stuff like that, he spent a lot of time saving his money and spending his money and making sure that we were well fed, the rent was paid, everything was taken care of, I had plenty of toys and, you know, went to a good school and that everything, there was heat and air conditioning, which, believe it or not, for large parts of my life, I lived without such nice things as heat, air conditioning, and lots of food, and that's a different story for a different day. But all of that was taken care of, yet the man was never happy, he was always so full of hatred and anger and took it all out on us. Yet he'd always say, I love you, I love you, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to make sure that you're well taken care of. And at the same time, you're getting your ass kicked every other day, which is very, very weird. And here's another sort of, uh, I don't know what the word is, dualism. So the man really, really hated my grandmother. I never, only once, which we're going to be getting to, saw any sort of love or affection for her. She was stupid, she was worthless, she was lazy, not good at anything, demeaning, talking down constantly. 
purposefully abusing, deriding, making fun of, all that sort of stuff. And at this point, this is the transition to the gameplay where I do really, really, really awful in the beginning. So please do forgive me, but later on I promise you I'm going to pick it back up and I'm going to go on a tear near the end with a chainsaw. Uh, we're talking psychological abuse, like constantly misleading and misplacing things, then blaming it on her and getting her confused to the point where she thought she was going crazy and couldn't quite tell what was real and what wasn't, and would then make fun of her for being stupid and this sort of stuff. So I only got was a whole lot of hatred for her, and then of course the I love you, I need to support the family, blah 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 family, that sort of thing, which was weird as a child, but in his later years the old man eventually went blind, not entirely blind, but blind to the point where he couldn't drive himself, so he asked me to take him uh, to Walmart to buy fishing line or something stupid like that, which my grandmother bitched at him constantly about all day, all the way into the car, uh, going to Walmart as we were pulling out of the driveway, just constantly bitching at him. She, he doesn't need that. He doesn't need that. He's fat and he old and he sit on the couch. You don't need to go fishing, blah, blah. And it was always, damn it, woman, you shut up. I know what I need, blah, blah, blah. It's my life. I can do whatever. We go to Walmart and he tells me he didn't need any fishing line. He didn't need any of whatever it was that he told us to go get. He was actually going to get a Valentine's present present for her so that he could express his love and gratitude for her taking care of him and all this sort of stuff. And he gets uh, a little, uh, you know, Hershey's box of hearts, just the generic, you know, Walmart hearts, which for a person that grew up in the Depression era, which it still carries over uh, in, into our mentality today, this more food is better, that chocolate is the greatest thing in the world, even though they're incredibly cheap goods now. They're, they're like disposable, like impulse purchases. They were like the greatest shit ever for these old people. Uh, he gets that and brings it home. And I'm there when he gives her her Valentine's gift, and she says, what the hell is this? And I can already see his face starting to sink. She says, what? He was like, you know I don't like these Valentine's gifts. I told you not to get anything. I didn't get you a damn thing. You shouldn't have done this, blah, blah, blah. We weren't celebrating Valentine's Day. And he says, I just wanted to show that I cared about you. And she's like, ha, huh, you know, you could show that every day instead of just getting me chocolate, blah, blah, blah. And I could see... Even on the face of this old man who was, you know, hard as nails as far as I was concerned at the time that it was cracking and breaking and that an actual sadness was developing because he could see what people actually thought of him. I don't know if he was reflecting upon his past actions or not or if it was just a totally new epiphany, but it was really painful, but he kept it together and uh, he said, I will, uh, he said, you know, he thanked me for my help and he, I'll, I'll take it and I'll eat it and I'll deal with it and don't worry about this. And of course he got jokes about eating stuff, getting fat and all and that sort of stuff. Uh, so I just, I kind of, this is getting pretty awkward, so I kind of squeak on out of the house and I drive away to one part of the town. It was a just like a little short stop for my dad and I come back by and as I'm driving by on the road because the house was pretty close to a main road in town I look out in the front yard and I see my grandfather just sitting there just just kind of like leaning up against the house holding his hearts just kind of looking up into the sky and I know he can't see a damn thing so what I do is I make a little u-turn I come back around I drive right by the house close enough to see and the old guy's sitting in front of the house crying constantly because his uh his uh, token of affection was shot down, which is confusing to me because that never would have happened if he hadn't just treated my grandmother like shit for the last year. Just, uh, But it seemed to like finally sink in that what had been going on was wrong uh, in, in some way. And in that way you can see that even the most evil, the, even the most mean of cruel things are not always the most intentional. Sometimes it just happens on accident. Sometimes they didn't really mean it or understand what they were doing exactly. And I believe the comeback that I spoke of is going to be starting pretty soon. Uh, yeah, this, this should be where I start to really pick things up and struggle really hard. It's a little bit late in this game, mind you. I think that once I die, I get about five or six kills and I go on a tear. Uh, here's another interesting duality. Uh, the man was super controlling uh, throughout my entire life. He held most of the financial instruments, so pretty much anything went his way. Uh, he gave me my first vehicle. It was it was just a gift, but it came with a buttload of rules and regulations and stipulations and constant meddling and nosing. And it was almost not worth it. It was so much trouble, but it was a nice vehicle. A uh, lot of little things like that. Any sort of gift that you get isn't necessarily a gift, as it was an instrument of control. Yet at the same time, when I turned, um, I think it was 21. I got a college fund, and I assumed this college fund would come with so many legal restrictions, so many uh, 
personal restrictions. It would go into his bank account, and I would have to justify every expenditure and all this sort of stuff. Because that's how pretty much everything in the past worked. And, and like I said, it was almost not worth not worth having it at all for all the trouble. But this one was a no rules college fund. I just I just got all of the money, and he said I saved this for you, and I think that you're old enough to make good decisions with it, and I'll just trust you with it. And said please don't do anything stupid and make me regret this, and that's it. And it was baffling to me. I don't. You're probably thinking that's a stupid story to tell, but if you grow up for like 20 years with a person that will uh, add stipulations to a $5, you know, ice cream cone, or uh, the the uh, God, the vehicle had so many rules, or every single little thing you've ever done having buttloads of rules, regulations, stipulations, taxes, paybacks, all this kind of crazy stuff, and then all of a sudden you get this massive college fund. It's like here you go, have fun. I trust you. It's 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 earth shaking. It, it's so confusing and weird at the same time. And I'm really glad that's the case because I was able to use the college fund for a lot of things that weren't college but were also very important to me, some of them being the qu equipment for this YouTube channel, which ended up being much more important in my life than the college education was, but that it's just funny how that works out. Or one of the weirdest dualities, and this is where we're getting racist, and I put it toward the very end of this video because I'm assuming only the most mature and interested of people are living this far, are listening uh, this far in. The man really, really, really hated black people, as far as I could tell. Very little sympathy for black people. Uh, he knew Emmett Till personally. I don't know if you're familiar with Emmett Till, but you can Google him. Had nothing but mean things to say about that kid. Uh, hated black people in public, missed segregation, doesn't think that they should be allowed to vote. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things like this. Some of them uh, were with reason. The voting thing had to do with voter IDs because they did and sometimes still do go around and vote at multiple precincts. And then at the same time, you know, I would go to school and they would show us the the literacy test that you had to pass if you were black to vote. So like white people could just vote whenever, but black people had to pass a literacy test. And it would be like, you know, nine basic questions of literacy, grammar, that sort of thing. And then the tenth question is, interpret this phrase from the U.S. Constitution. It would be the most random of phrases, and they would ask the black person to interpret it. And, uh, you know, interpre interpretation... Uh, interpretations are subjective and the subjective test would be like oh you're black your interpretation is just wrong no matter what it is so of course they couldn't vote and there's this sort of thing but nothing good to say about black people pretty much never ever ever uh, pretty hateful uh, it warped my view of black people just forever because that's all I knew growing up until I got out and went to college and stuff you know I learned better and at the same time even though there was all this racism and negativity he declined invites to join the Ku Klux Klan and what was later a more polite organization, the CCC, the Concerned Citizens Council, or, or some variant of it. Not only did he decline to join these organizations, but he said that they were bad for the nation as a whole and publicly shamed any friends that did join. So I don't understand what the logic here is about a man that can hate black people so much and wish that Jim Crow was back and yet bash on his friends for joining the KKK or CCC and this sort of thing. Oh, here's an, another interesting one. So this guy was a manager at a company, right? And back in the day in Mississippi, pretty much all of the low-end manual labor was done by poor white people, which was white trash, or, or blacks. Any kind of blacks, there were basically no rich blacks, or very, very few. And he paid his black workers more on average than any other businesses. I don't think it was quite the same as the white workers, but the black workers, he went out of his way to pay them more than any other competing business around them, which his bosses hated. And I never even got a clear answer as to why. I don't know if it was about employee retention or what, but he had all of the, I, I think it was the better black workers in town because everybody liked him and his business because he paid them more, which was really, really weird because he thought of them like cockroaches as far as I was concerned. Or here's another interesting one. Tells me constantly about how black people are stupid and worthless and can't be saved and can't be taught any better and it's part of their culture and they just evolved in Africa and just shit grows on trees and they can eat it. Yet at the same time, the you know the black workers that he was with, they had problems with uh, budget balancing and payday loans, predatory loans, and this sort of stuff. And that's because none of them went to school past eighth grade. They didn't know any better. Man goes out of his way to teach financial planning. To all of his workers, teaches them how to save his money, how to do basic checks, balancing, budgeting, bills, you know, arithmetic, stuff that, again, they didn't get a whole lot of in school because there was no need in going to school and or didn't or couldn't or the schools weren't very good for whatever reason, yet absolutely hated him. So I don't in entirely understand why or what, like, the man is literally taking steps to make the black community better, yet at the same time, bashing on it just like it's the most awful thing since, uh, since cancer. So I just don't understand that sort of duality. 
And I know that was probably a little bit hard to swallow for a lot of you people, but that's just the reality of it. Which leads me to the point of what makes a person good, bad, or evil? How can a person who, in on one hand, is constantly doing bad things and creating sort of a bad aura or bad or negativity, yet on the other hand, doing some of the more liberal, open-minded, uh, you know, goody two-shoes um, things that you could possibly do? Is that good? Is that bad? Is that neutral? Self-interested? Ugly? Confused? Maybe? I don't exactly know. I, r I really don't. I don't have a pinpoint for this. And it's something that left me really confused for most of my adult life. And I know that's not terribly important for you, but for me, my grandparents were like a second set of parents because they literally raised me since, you know, forever. So, in my perspective, it was really, really weird to have this sort of duality of, of good, bad, and evil kind of going on and not really being able to be sure if I could go around and tell people like, oh no, you know, grandfather was a scumbag or you know, he had a bad mouth but he was a good person or I don't exactly have a good philosophical answer for you here. I just kind of felt like talking about this, kind of throwing it out there, letting you think about it. And it also should give you some introspection on your own actions. Are what is what you say important? Is what you do important? How will people remember you when you're gone? Will they remember you the way you intended to be, the way you want to be, the way you really are? Or what? Just some little brain teaser, a little bit to think on. Unfortunately, as hard as I tried with as many kill streaks as I could, I just could not pull this game out. I couldn't win. Though I do think 27 and 19 after coming back from like, what was that, like 4 and 12, something like that, with 8 captures is pretty good, especially against a team where 4 of them were all in the same party. I hope you enjoyed the commentary. I hope you learned something useful. And if you did, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.